There is one thing every lifter in the world dreams about. No, it's not the old school pre-workout Jack 3D or length and partials. It's the idea of gaining muscle without gaining fat, or even better, gaining muscle while losing fat. Pause and think about it for a second. You're training day in, day out, and you're slowly seeing your muscles grow without any fat gain. If anything, you're getting slightly leaner while also growing. Your abs are still there and you're just getting bigger. No bloat, no, oh man, I'm fat, nothing. Peak human experience moment. Is that really possible though? I mean, sure, it is if you were to use PDs, but none of that here. We carry the natty lifter flag proudly. Psych, just kidding, I'm not natty. Psych, just kidding, I am natty. Psych, just kidding again, I am not natty. Psych, just kidding, I'm natty again. Buy my products that don't work so I can buy an overpriced RSQ8. Just kidding, easy stab there, had to do it. Proud natty's here. Fuck anyone who makes people think they can't make gains natty or fucks with their brains. In this video, I'll go over everything you need to know as a natural lifter, including the latest science about whether it's actually possible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time, as well as gaining muscle without gaining much, if any, fat. I'll also go over the pros and cons of the usual ways people go for gaining muscle, in that way, you can be fully informed about each approach, manage your expectations accordingly, and decide which approach is for you. But let's start with the million dollar question. Is it possible to gain muscle while losing fat? Or is this a pipe dream that comes on the back of bodybuilders on PEDs, achieving it, and then talking about it as if it's possible for everyone? Oh, it's definitely a thing. A 2022 study followed previously untrained older women during 24 weeks of lifting. Those who ate more protein while lifting gained muscle while losing fat, while women with lower protein intake lost a similar amount of fat but built less muscle. When looking at obese individuals who begin lifting, we also see the same thing even when dieting. Those who lift and consume protein not only lose fat but gain a bunch of muscle simultaneously. So, if you're untrained or obese, things are looking relatively positive as far as gaining muscle while losing fat at the same time. We even have data showing that untrained lifters can gain a bunch of muscle while minimizing fat gain when actually bulking, when actually gaining weight. I can now see you squinting at your screen and thinking, is this going to be one of those videos where he tells us that unless you're obese or untrained, gaining muscle while losing fat is not possible? Do not worry, my friend, it is not. A somewhat classic 22 review by Barricade and colleagues, shout out, looked at whether trained lifters can really gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. They concluded that body recomposition, which essentially means gaining muscle while losing fat, isn't limited to beginners or overweight people. It can and does occur in experienced lifters when progressive resistance training is paired with the right nutrition. Higher protein intakes, often above two grams per kilo of body weight, while managing calories appropriately and training the right way, can help you build muscle even while in a deficit. The latter is something that is also supported by the now infamous 2025 Refalo et al. review, which showed that consuming up to three grams of protein per kilo of body weight may allow for muscle gain even during a fat loss phase. Lastly, in many of the studies that we and other labs conduct, specifically looking at muscle growth, in many cases, participants maintain their body weight throughout the course of the study and still manage to gain muscle. This is something that is not often mentioned as most of these studies are not designed to explore the topic of recomposition, but it's interesting nonetheless. As a brief example, look at the superset study by Berkatal, which was recently accepted for publication, congrats, where trained participants saw increases in muscle mass while experiencing a small decrease in body fat percentage. Again, this is not a study that was designed to look at recomposition, and participants were instructed to maintain their usual diet without any changes to protein intake or dietary advice at all. So yeah, again, mentioning this as a cool fun fact, not as evidence for recomposition. But overall, you can see that you can gain muscle and lose some fat as a trained individual. However, this is the part where a reality check or rather a reminder might be useful. Visibly noticeable muscle growth takes time, especially after your first years of training. When we talk about significant growth in studies, this usually refers to pre and post study significant changes in muscle thickness, usually measured in millimeters. Not, hey dude, you look like a different person and so much more jacked sort of differences. It's important to keep this in mind though, because I do not want you to expect that in two to three months, you will all of a sudden lose a ton of fat and gain a ton of muscle to the point where you will be unrecognizable. However, enough of that, let's get to the how. The tips that I'm gonna say apply to both beginners and advanced lifters. However, if you're obese, 
not as defined by BMI, because I am obese by BMI, but actually at a very high body fat percentage, I think around 35% and above for men, and you're also untrained, I'd recommend that you go on a 500 to 700 calorie deficit, steadily losing weight every week while also consuming at least 1.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight and lifting consistently, hitting roughly 10 hard sets per muscle group per week. You will likely make amazing gains and lose quite a bit of fat. My recommendations mostly stem from a health perspective, as the less time you spend being at a very high body fat percentage, the better. Not a huge deal though. But let's get back to body recomposition. The first thing you wanna do is figure out your maintenance calories. If you've been counting calories for a while and know roughly where your maintenance is, then that's great. If not, use any total energy expenditure calculator you find online. I've got a really cool one linked in the description. Enter your body weight, height, age, and physical activity level, and it will give you a very rough estimate of the calories that you need to maintain your weight. Be somewhat conservative with the activity level that you set. From my coaching experience, people tend to somewhat overestimate how active they are. After you have that rough estimation, simply do your best to track your calories for two to four weeks while also weighing yourself daily under the same conditions so that you can look at your average weight change from week to week. Allow me to note, super important note, the tracking is more or less mandatory as calorie estimation equations are not extremely accurate. That said, they will give you a rough idea of your maintenance calories to go off of. Keep in mind that traveling uh, or massive changes to your sleep schedule, eating later than usual, drinking more fluids, all that can affect your body weight regardless of fat gain or not. For that period of time where you're tracking your weight, you'd ideally want to be in relatively consistent conditions versus doing it while you're on holiday or whatever. Okay, now you've roughly figured out your maintenance calories. I say roughly as I don't want you to think that you must become some sort of a tracking robot and roughly knowing when, where maintenance is while keeping an eye on your weight every day will be fine. The whole point of this and other videos that I make is long-term habit building while putting gains on autopilot. Okay, now it's time to plan your macros. This is nothing complicated whatsoever. Simply do your best to hit two to three grams of protein per kilo of body weight every day while consuming a minimum of 0.6 to 0.7 grams of fat per kilogram of body weight every day and somewhere around 25 to 40 grams of fiber. As long as you hit those goals, the rest will likely fall into place. Protein is the primary macro for body recomposition, with studies consistently supporting the notion that higher protein diets may facilitate better recomposition even when on maintenance calories, especially in trained lifters. Allow me to note that it's definitely fine if you eat a bit less protein on a day here and a day there. As long as your lifting is on point, we're good. More on that in a sec. Fat and fiber are both important for your overall health, that's the recommended minimums. Do your best to consume fat mostly from healthy sources like olive oil, fatty fish, nuts, etc. And ideally have plenty of fruits and vegetables in your diet. Carbs, despite the lies that we've been told growing up in the lifting community, are really not that big of a deal for lifters. Don't lose your mind, let me explain. Eating some carbs before your workout and having carbs in your diet is great, especially since foods high in carbs also often include fiber. That said, carbs are not nearly as important to lifting performance and muscle gain as they are for like an endurance athlete. For us, training without feeling hungry and consuming some carbs seems to be more than enough to maximize gains. Unfortunate, I know, but what can I do? I don't like the data either, but the data is the data. As far as supplements go, consider using some form of protein powder. Whey if you eat animal products or something like soy protein if you don't, but it's really not necessary. It may just make days easier, some days easier than others when it comes to consuming enough protein. Additionally, creatine monohydrate would be a good idea as a supplement as it's the only supplement that may actually make a difference to your muscle gains, but again, not mandatory. Now, before we talk about training, let's briefly talk about tracking. You want to track your body weight, make sure that it's staying roughly the same. I say roughly because the, your weight will fluctuate from week to week by a bit. As long as the fluctuations are relatively minor and consistent, you're doing great. If you do find that your weight is either consistently training up or down, simply add or subtract 200 to 300 calories from your diet and you should be good. Add or subtract more as needed if the trend continues. Your training performance will also be a good way for you to assume that good things are happening. If you're performing more reps and weight over time while maintaining your weight and hitting your protein, then you're probably on the right track. You also want to track your waist circumference, bicep, chest, and thigh circumference. If the former stays the same or decreases while the other slightly increase, you know that good things are happening. Additionally, take a few relaxed and flexed pictures after you go to the toilet at the same day and time of the week. Ideally in the same exact spot, same camera, same placement, same light, etc. No biggie if you can't, 
but it would be helpful if you did. I would advise against using home scales that use bioelectrical impedance analysis to assess changes in body fat, as they can be quite bad with tracking changes. The same goes for DEXA, especially since doing frequent DEXA scans is likely not great from a health standpoint. I know that looking at a number to see if you've made progress is appealing, but at the end of the day, circumference measurements, performance in the gym, and visually assessing your body comp are, in my opinion, much better ways for you to know if you're gaining muscle and losing some fat. That's all as far as nutrition and tracking goes. Let's get to training. I've said this before and I'll say it until I die. Lifting is the stimulus for muscle growth. Do the lifting part right and good things will happen even if the other variables are not 100% on point. The number one thing you must do is ensure that the majority of your sets are zero to two reps in reserve. A good way to go about it, in my honest opinion, is to take the last half of your sets on a few exercises to complete failure. For example, if you're doing four sets of incline dumbbell press, take the last two sets to failure. This will ensure that one, you're getting maximum stimulus, and two, it will allow you to G-check yourself and know if your failure predictions are on point. At this stage, allow me to note that if you took all your sets to the point of one to two reps in reserve and no sets were taken to failure, it would likely be fine. However, although in lab settings, people are pretty good at estimating reps in reserve, in my coaching and lifting experience, this is not often the case in the real world. My recommendations of taking two sets to failure mostly stems from having an intensity of effort fail-safe, ensuring you're indeed getting all you can from your workouts from a stimulus standpoint. A recent study investigated this topic by essentially randomizing trained lifters to perform resistance training using either descending weekly reps in reserve, four, three, two, one reps in reserve, or staying constantly close to failure. After 10 weeks, both groups showed similar quad hypertrophy. However, triceps hypertrophy appeared to somewhat favor the descending reps in reserve condition, though the statistical analysis indicated probabilistic uncertainty. This study essentially hinted at the fact that you may not need to train very close to failure on every set to achieve robust hypertrophy. As long as some sets are performed near failure, comparable gains can be achieved by leaving a few reps in reserve on others. As far as training volume goes, aka how many sets you perform per week, I recommend that you do anywhere between 12 to 20 sets per week for most muscle groups while pushing volume at 20 to 30 sets per week for muscle groups you truly want to prioritize. Even if you keep everything in the 12 to 20 uh, range or even below that, you will make gains. But this is where as a natty, you want to err more on the side of optimization, especially since you're trying to kill two birds with one stone. When I say 12 to 20 sets, I'm referring to fractional sets. Fractional sets essentially account for the fact that not all exercises contribute equally to the training volume of a given muscle group. For example, if you perform a set of incline dumbbell press, that counts as one full set for your chest, but only a fractional set, say about half, for the triceps and front delts, since those muscles are also working, but not as hard as your chest. I'd also recommend doing a few of your sets specifically as length and partials, as they may give you a bit more growth in some cases. In theory, you could do all your sets of the partials, but full ROM with a good stretch is fine too. At this point, allow me to note that if you don't want to think about your training whatsoever, but still want to make sure that you're getting an optimized program for muscle growth, even when maintaining, consider giving our app MyAdapt a go. MyAdapt is like a smart coach in your pocket, adapts to you, delivers truly individualized training without using any templates or AI cringe generated workouts. The algorithm of MyAdapt is handcrafted by exercise scientists and coaches and is constantly updated with the latest research. Check it out on myadapt.com or head to the Apple or Google Play Store. Use code DRPACK for a two week free trial. Alternatively, if you want this guy, to guide your training and nutrition, head to drpack.com to book a free intro call. When it comes to training frequency, train as frequently as you like. Ideally, a minimum of three days per week, not because muscle growth benefits from greater frequency, but so that you can keep volume relatively high. As it stands, the ceiling for productive volume per session seems to be roughly 11 sets per muscle group per session. So if you only have a day to dedicate it to a specific muscle group, that's likely not ideal, but again, fine. On that note, if I was you, I would likely opt for either an upper, lower, or a push-pull legs, as both do a great job with allowing you to have fun and productive training sessions while doing plenty of volume. Do your best to add reps and weight here and there, but as long as you're training to close to failure, this will happen regardless of whether you plan it or not. On to cardio. Just make sure that you're hitting eight to 10,000 steps per day or roughly 150 to 300 minutes of higher intensity physical activity per week so that you're covered from a health and general fitness perspective. That's it. No need to blast the Stairmaster, no need to do anything extreme. Just be active for your health. And now, 
For the second million dollar question, how long should I do this for? In my honest opinion, I'd commit at the very least three full months, but ideally six months to maintaining your weight, eating high protein and training progressively. You could even do it for up to a year, but roughly six months seems like a reasonable time period before assessing and pivoting to either a lean bulk or a cut. Which brings me to the accept and terms and conditions part of the video. As a natural lifter, committing to such an approach comes with the understanding that you aren't optimizing for either muscle growth or fat loss. If you want to make sure that you're leaving no stone unturned from a muscle growth perspective, slowly gaining weight over time by being roughly in a five to 10 calorie surplus is the way to go. Additionally, if you want to get leaner in the most efficient way possible, being in a 500 calorie deficit over time is also the way to go. That said, there are not many cases where I'd recommend you go on a YOLO bulk and gain a bunch of weight. The literature consistently shows that eating in a bigger surplus over 20% uh, leads to more fat gain rather than more muscle. Don't get me wrong, if you do end up going through a period of time where you eat more for whatever reason, you will still make top gains if you're training, but just not more than if you kept things tidy and gained less weight. Overall, the pros of trying to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time are that at worst, you will likely make some gains and not get fatter while having plenty of calories to make your diet sustainable. And that's all folks. I hope you found this video useful and regardless of how you decide to approach your muscle gain journey, I wish you the best of luck. I will personally keep you posted with my progress throughout this year and will likely make a proper video on it. As always, thank you for watching. Hit that there subscribe button. Check out myadub.com for our training app and stay blessed. Peace.